All right, I am, uh, I'm John. Come find me and talk to me. I'm friendly. Uh, since the cons last year, I've been learning about these things called SAT solvers, so if you don't know what they are, you're just where I was a year ago. We don't do this for work or anything like that. Um, not an expert. Uh, I'm actually just really interested in declarative programming. Don't read all that. Uh, uh, th I, I, this is where I found uh, the term declarative programming. I didn't know that was like a thing you could like Google, you know? Um, but there's a lot of talk, of, you know, like core logic, Clara rules, or the rule engines and stuff are all in this space. But I don't recall a talk on constraint solvers or, or those things in recent history. I didn't do the, the check to make sure I'm not talking about crazy stuff. Um, but declarative programming in one sense is just separating the what and the how of your programming. So the sort of promise is that you can describe your problem or, dis or specify your problem and let the, the solver or the engine get the answer that you want. And if you sort of do this uh, survey of the space, you find a, a lot of stuff that has the same kind of shape. Um, so it's a really narrow interface, a, a simple interface. Uh, it could be called solve or run. Uh, and all the leverage comes from these things, uh, the constraint language. Uh, and I had a whole bunch of slides that I had cut for time about how awesome constraints were, and it was sad. Um, but they are really awesome. I mean, they're general. They apply to tons of domains. Uh, they're very, very composable. Uh, and they remove, it, it, at least the spirit of, of the constraints is that you remove a lot of the ordering complexity that comes from just day-to-day -day programming. So sort of running your program backwards just kind of falls out from this lack of ordering. But this is not a talk on constraint languages and the subtleties there. This is a talk that's going to try and fill in this magic comment on this slide. Uh, so here's our outline. We're going to talk about the Boolean satisfiability problem, usually just abbreviated SAT for short. Uh, then we're going to peek under the hood a little bit and look at some of the algorithms uh, involved in uh, SAT solving, do this case study. And then we're going to open the junk drawer of you know, rants and random bits and stuff I just shoved into a thing I call discussion. Uh, so SAT, satisfiability. I think we're all familiar with this problem uh, where we have some piece of hardware or circuit diagram that we need to I'm, look, I'm getting some blank. Okay, I don't actually have this problem. Um, <laughs> usually I'm trying to get my like, CSS selectors to just work. Um, but we, you know, people have this problem somewhere. And uh, usually you just try to figure out, okay, can my hardware get into some you know, known bad state that I don't want it to get in? Or, or see an example where it does uh, go into that state. Or maybe I just want to replace my hardware design with a, a simpler hardware design that uses less transistors or something. And I want to provably know that these two things are 100% equivalent. Uh, how, we would, how would we tackle something like this? Well, the most natural thing is just to take that uh, circuit diagram and, and translate it into some Boolean expression. So this is something a little bit more familiar. I've also written in closure, so that, that's a winner, right? Um, and hand this, this Boolean expression off to a solver and have it see if this is satisfiable or not. And so. If it is satisfiable, we call that SAT, and we'd also like some kind of uh, satisfying assignment, uh, some kind of assignment of the variables in our expression that make the whole thing true. Now, if it's unsat, uh, if it can't be satisfied, we'd also like it to produce some kind of proof. Uh, and I think this is like a list of clauses. It's not something I, I understand, so it's omitted from the talk. Uh, but you do want some kind of proof back to say why this is unsatisfiable. Usually hand that off to another tool to double check its work. Um, and, and so just to be totally clear here, we're not, we're not just trying a million uh, guesses and saying, uh, you know, I timed out. This is really a proof. This is, really, you know, and so these are, these are tiny examples, but for a large problem, uh, this is not so much fun. Um, now, you can't just hand any uh, Boolean expression to one of these solvers. You do have to put it in there. You have to kind of massage it into the CNF or uh, conjunctive normal form, and we'll go through some terminology here quickly. Uh, these things, you might call these variables, but uh, the literature calls these uh, literals. So there's a sort of subtle difference here. Uh, X2 and not X2 are referring to the same variable. We would think of that as the same variable, but X2, not X2 are two different literals. So you can put those in the same clause, which brings us to clauses. Clauses are just uh, or expressions of literals. And so to satisfy a clause, you just make any of the literals inside that true. Uh, and then this one down here at the bottom gets a sort of special name. Uh, we like those. Those are called unit clauses, and those are like gimmies, you know? So you look for those. 
Uh, this whole thing gets wrapped up in an AND because we want to satisfy all the clauses simultaneously. That's the goal. And this whole thing just is referred to as a SAT instance. So if I say the word instance, I'm just talking about the whole problem. Now, at this point in the talk, I legally have to tell you that this is an NP-complete problem, which usually sends us running. You know, this is not something we like to hear, but I'm going to make the case, because, uh, you know, exponential time problems are not really, you know, awesome. Uh, but I'm going to make the case that this is actually a good thing, because there's a ton of other NP-complete problems that we can just sort of map back to SAT, and SAT sort of becomes a target for those things. Uh, SAT solvers get, you know, sort of highly engineered, very well-tuned, and if we can just uh, get our problem over to SAT, uh, I think we're in a good shape. So we've already seen circuit satisfiability. There's also a ton of graph stuff that you can sort of map back to SAT, uh, but there's actually important problems, too, like Bejeweled and Candy Crush, <laughs> I guess. Anyway, uh, they do have a, a SAT competition that's sort of co-hosted with the SAT conference every year, and you can sort of get an idea, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, some of the other applications. It's usually, like, again, formal verification kind of stuff, uh, software uh, verification, AI planning, stuff like that, and, uh, you know, SAT sort of becomes, like, the target for that stuff, like I said. Uh, just to give you an idea, so they, they have benchmarks that you can download, it's a two gigabyte giant file of these things. Um, usually the, the benchmarks are in the range of like 3,000 variables, uh, 10,000 clauses, and they usually go in about an hour uh, timeout. But they solve most of them, and uh, some of the quicker ones are usually solved in a few minutes. Um, so they're really getting pretty good. Uh, in industry, I've heard rumors that these things get up to like millions of variables and millions of clauses. I was not able to verify that. Uh, but I did look at the, the conference website, and <laughs> there was this there was a, a solver that produced an unsat proof that was uh, two terabytes of unsat proof. So I mean, it's like some pretty big stuff. Uh, so these things get big, and we would like some help with our problem. So this is sort of the declarative uh, workflow, right? We want to work in our problem at a very high level. We want to describe our problem in a language, in a constraint language that's close to our problem. And then we want to go through some kind of encoding process. So usually that's like a, a polynomial time, not, maybe not x squared, or n squared. Uh, but it's a very fast encoding process. Uh, and then we hand that thing over, in this case in CNF, to a SAT solver, and that thing can be highly engineered, reused lo uh, across uh, lots of domains, um, and can help us with the exponential time of our problem. So what does this encoding process look like? We're just going to encode something that's a little uh, familiar to us, hopefully, uh, Sudoku, and we're just going to encode a single cell of this. I think once we, we see how to encode a single cell into SAT, uh, it's basically trivial to encode the rest of the problem. So we're going to do that. Now, if we had core logic, how would we do this? Well, you can just write it almost in English in core logic. You fresh up a new uh, logic variable. We'll call it cell. And then we just say that the value of cell is exactly, it has exactly one value, and it's in the range uh, or domain of, of the numbers 1 through 9. So this is really easy in core logic, but we're in SAT. We only have Booleans. How can we do this? Uh, you probably jump to the answer in your head. Let's use nine Boolean variables, or literals. Um, and you might take a first crack at it, writing something like this. Now, this gets us partway to the solution, but of course, this also allows for something like this. And a cell can't have one and two, it has to have exactly one. Well, we can prevent that by adding another clause uh, for that exact situation. Uh, but now we have sort of a whack-a-mole problem, right? And we can keep adding clauses and keep adding clauses until we get to this sort of cross-product of all our literals. Uh, and that does actually get the job done. Um, it's not pretty. I think there are more clever ways to do this, but I don't care. Um, you just wrap all that stuff into another function, call it one hot. Uh, and now we know that if we give this uh, a bunch of literals, exactly one of them have to be true. And with that one hot function, we can code the fact that you know, there can only be one one in any column or row or box. And then we have to code, the encode uh, the specifics, specifics of our Sudoku problem, uh, the fact that this cell holds uh, five. And we can just add a bunch of unit clauses to the end of our SAT problem, or our instance. Uh, and that gets us the whole way there. So now let's take a, a sort of peek under the hood and look at some of the algorithms that have made this sort of tractable. Uh, and our, our mental model for this is going to be depth first search. Uh, and then we're going to, you know, once we go through an example uh, to feel what depth first search feels like, uh, we're going to layer on tweaks and algorithmic changes until we're basically not doing depth first search anymore. 
So let's get an idea of what this feels like for uh, a problem with three variables. Uh, we have to take a guess here. So we'll choose that x1 is true. And we're going to call these decisions in the literature. Uh, we're going to choose that x2 is true and choose x, choose x3 to be true. And once we've made all those decisions, we can plug that into our expression and try it out and see if it's sat. Uh, if it's not, then we backtrack, undo that x3 assignment, set that to false, and try it again. If this, if this does satisfy our Boolean expression, then we just return. We're done. We, we'd like to go here very quickly if we can. Uh, but if that doesn't work out, we have to backtrack twice this time, go back up a level, change x2, try x3 is true again, and we sort of just do this. And this is just brute force, right? Uh, until we hit all the leaves of our search space, backtrack all the way, and if we ever get back to the sort of, sort of root node, um, we know that our problem is unsat, and we can just uh, tell people that. Uh, before we start changing this, let's just uh, admire the flexibility we have in the search space. We don't have to try true first. We can try false first. We have that flexibility. Uh, we don't have to try x1 just because I called it x1 first. We can try x3 first and try these things in any order, and you'll definitely want to do this. Uh, use clever heuristics here. But what's the first thing that we can do to get away from this sort of brute force, depth first search uh, arena? Because this is not going to scale to n equals a million. Well, if we think back to Sudoku, uh, there's stuff like this, right? Uh, we don't have to guess what's in this cell. Uh, what's in this cell? Seven. I don't know why I did that. Um, uh, there's an analog here. We can just deduce uh, stuff about our SAT problem. If we know that x2, x1 and x2 are false, uh, we can just sort of infer that x3 is false. So this feels like, you know, we're getting information for free. We don't have to guess. Uh, this is called unit propagation because that clause is the same as this one uh, when two of them are set. Uh, and here we can just infer that x4 is true. We get that for free. And it's called propagation because we're going to do this recursively. We're going to keep doing it. So here we've learned that x4 is true. Plug that into the second one uh, and deduce that x5 is true. Now, in the course of this unit propagation, if we ever encounter a situation like this, uh, this is clearly not satisfied. So this is uh, the same as an or expression like this. And so it's referred to as the empty clause. Uh, and then, of course, that's a conflict. So we need to backtrack. So what does unit propagation get us? It means we don't have to go all the way to the leaves of our search space uh, before we find out that we've hit a conflict. And we can just backtrack much earlier. So if we sort of uh, have this yin yang uh, between decision making and unit propagation, we get DPLL after uh, the four authors. This is like sort of, uh, you'll see things akin to this in other areas, but in SAT, this is called DPLL. And we'll solve a real problem just to make sure we fully get it, and we'll solve this again later. Uh, on the pro uh, our instance is on the right, and our root node is on the left. So first, we're going to do unit propagation. I don't see any unit clauses, so we have to make a guess. Uh, so we decide that x7 is false. And now we see this clause, and that gives us x8 is false. Uh, with that information, there's no other uh, propagations we can make, so we have to make uh, another guess here. So x9 is true. And we see this clause here at the bottom. We can use information from both decision levels to find out that x10 is also true. And again, we can't do anything else. So we have to make one more decision here. x1 is false. And here we're going to get a sort of chain reaction. Uh, we'll see this chain reaction again later. Uh, we got these two clauses uh, that prove uh, x2 and x3 are true. Not prove, but um, then we get this clause that uh, with x2 and x3, we can uh, solve for x4. Then we get x5. And now we get to an interesting situation where x6 is both false and true. Well, that's no good. Um, I could have put one of these x6s in the other one and gotten the empty clause, but I'm going to show it. Uh, show it this way. And of course, if we hit a contradiction like this, uh, we have to backtrack. So we'll backtrack, uh, change x1 to true, and through a bunch of other decisions that I'm not going to show you, eventually we get to a satisfying assignment. So that's DPLL. It's fairly straightforward. You probably would uh, just write that you know, after um, working on this for a little bit, especially if you're familiar with some other areas. And like I said, there's sort of a yin yang between making decisions and unit propagation. So we'd like to actually improve both of those. And there's a, a solver around, uh, I think, 99, uh, 2000, uh, called Chaff, or, and it was changed to ZChaff. 
uh, SAT solver that did this. So, so vSIDS is a, is a heuristic that you can use to make better decisions. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but it's, it's actually relatively simple. Uh, it's just ranking the uh, literals by the number of occurrences, and hopefully assigning those first uh, gets you to a solution faster. The other thing it did was uh, an improved unit propagation uh, using a clever uh, sort of invariant uh, that they called two watch literals. And we'll go through this in some detail, because I think it's pretty interesting. Um, so here, let's, let's imagine we have a, a large SAT instance on the, on the right, and that's there. Uh, what happens in unit propagation? Well, when we get an assignment like X3 is false, we have to sort of scan all the clauses in our SAT instance. Uh, sometimes, these, because these things are large, our SAT instance sometimes will call us a clause database. And once I say the word database, you probably know where I'm going. We would like to add an index uh, so that when we set this uh, to X3 to false, we can jump right to the clauses that are involved. Uh, but we can actually do a little bit better than this uh, using some clever uh, thing about unit propagation. When does unit propagation happen? When N minus one of the literals is set, and there's only one left unassigned. Uh, so we'd like to be notified, so to speak, exactly when that happens, and we'll get close. Um, so just to be totally clear, uh, if we only have X1 uh, set here, we can't do anything. So rather than indexing all th this clause by all three of these, let's just uh, uh, index by two of them at a time and always be watching two unassigned literals. And if we always have two unassigned literals, we know that this thing cannot be involved in unit propagation. Uh, this is a huge space savings if we have a very large clause, because we're still, it doesn't matter if there's a million literals in this thing, uh, we're just still only watching two. And if we ever assign one of the literals that we're not watching, well, we know that there's at least two un unassigned literals in this thing, and it's not going to be involved in unit propagation, so I don't care. If we do set one of the variables that we're watching, one of the literals that we're watching, uh, well, we have to keep, we have to maintain this invariant. Um, and so we're going to change our, our index to point to one of the other unassigned literals. And if we ever do, in fact, uh, assign n minus one of these things, uh, we will be notified, and we can uh, propagate uh, as usual. So what does this get us? Uh, it, it goes from something like this to something like this. And so we're watching a lot less of the clauses. Uh, it's a huge space and time savings. Uh, I think the ZChaff paper says something like, 90% uh, of their time or something was spent in unit propagation, which sort of led them to this technique. So I thought that was kind of clever. Uh, but now kind of for the main algorithmic uh, event, uh, CDCL uh, solvers, uh, conflict-driven clause learning. This was introduced by a solver called GRASP, uh, also around the same time, I think around 2000 or something. Uh, this is so important that you will hear uh, some solvers called CDCL SAT solvers. It's, it's like a whole genre of these things, and so this, this is very important. And the, uh, the, the main insight here is that when we run into a conflict like this, we can actually do some analysis on this to learn some new information that's going to help us uh, solve our problem faster. And to do that, we use something in the literature called an implication graph. So let's walk through this. Uh, if you remember from decision level one, we had x7 was false, and we learned that x8 was also false. And then on decision level three, I'm omitting some stuff here, uh, we decided that X1 was, also, was going to be false. And that led to our chain reaction, right? So let's watch that chain reaction in the implication graph. Uh, that implies that X2 was true, X3 was true, and now we have X2 and X3. We can imply X4 is also true. We get X5, and this is where we hit our conflict. Uh, we have X6 is false and true. Now if I isolate the conflict, you can sort of see this is like a dependency graph, right? Uh, the stuff on the left eventually sort of, not forced, but leads to the stuff on the right, the conflict, and we'd like that not to happen. But this whole solver state is not involved in this, and if I remove some of the nodes, that becomes very clear. It doesn't matter how we got to this assignment of these three literals, uh, it's always, once we uh, arrive at that assignment, we're always going to hit the same conflict. Uh, this little dotted white line is called a cut, and we have some flexibility in where we make that cut as long as we isolate the conflict from the, uh, the literals that led to it. Uh, so if I move it, you can get to a different uh, set of literals. Uh, and this uh, particular, particular cut is called the uh, first unique implication uh, point. Not particularly important, but just know that I strategically picked it. Um, 
And uh, you know, for this uh, thing that I just said, uh, the stuff on the left is the reason side, the stuff on the right is the conflict side. Uh, so the reason side, our solver state, led to the conflict. And what's true about our solver state? So there's an, uh, you know, this is, this is true, this uh, expression is true when, our, when we're in this state. Uh, so x4 is true and x7 uh, and 8 are false. And we'd like to learn something from this and the name implies that we're gonna learn a clause. So, so we're gonna turn this into a new clause. And I'll show you how I do that. So uh, you know, go back to sixth grade where you have to show your work. Uh, this solver, you know, this expression was true and it led to this conflict and what we would like to not have a conflict. And there's a thing in propositional logic called the contra contrapositive. Contrapositive says that if x implies y, and you ever discover that y is not true, then you knew x was not true. If it's raining outside, and I always carry an umbrella when it's raining, if you ever see me without an umbrella, uh, then you know it's not raining. So, uh, you know, if we negate uh, the conflict side, we can also negate our solver state, but this doesn't get us to a clause quite yet. We also have to use the Morgan laws. And you might know this, uh, just kind of ad hoc and maybe not the name, uh, but all that says is that if we ever negate an and clause or an or clause, we just flip the operator and negate all the other literals in the expression. And so that now, finally, we've sort of proven that if we don't want a conflict, uh, this thing has to be true. What did that really buy us? Well, if the original problem was satisfiable, this thing is also satisfiable, so we can just add it to our instance, and we can use this in our unit propagation as we continue to solve the problem. This is pretty nice. There's another benefit to this. Let's just imagine what would have happened if we had had this clause the whole time. You know, particularly, let's look at uh, decision level one, where we had x7 and x8 already. If we had had that and we knew those were false, we could have inferred that x4 was false, but it took us to decision level three to figure out that x4, or to, to, to try that x4 was true, and that's what led to the conflict. So we can actually back jump all the way to decision level one. We don't have to do a single level back, backtracking. So this is sometimes called non-chronological backtracking or back jumping, and it just means that we can just back, back uh, jump all the way up there and take a different path. And this cuts off huge swaths of the search space, and this is a, you know, a very clever algorithm. Now when you do this technique, there are a few concerns that you have to think about. Uh, you can't just add clauses forever. You get to like a, a space issue, and so you have a sort of garbage collection problem. And usually the answer is uh, just keep some bounded number of these clauses around, uh, removing redundant ones or, or uh, keeping important ones or something. Uh, you can also uh, minimize clauses before you admit them to the clause database. So you may have some, you know, you may have learned a clause that's like a thousand literals or something, but there may be some redundancy in there, and using a, a trick called resolution and your other clauses, you can minimize some of that stuff uh, before you admit it, and so that's a space savings. The uh, last concern, uh, if you're doing this, you probably want to do something called phase saving. And uh, you can sort of imagine that, uh, you know, the conflict that you ran into is in a completely different part of your problem that you already have solved. But because you've sort of probably uh, doing your problem all simultaneously and you back jump in one area, you're undoing the assignments in this other area. Uh, so we would like that not to happen if we can. And the trick here is just to remember the last uh, assignment that you had for everything. Uh, and then if you ever have to make a decision in that area again, you, well, you just try the last thing you tried before. Uh, this is a very nice technique and it makes things a, a lot faster. It doesn't undo as much work. Uh, so here, how, how important is this graph, uh, sort of um, numerically? Um, this graph is a really interesting graph. So this is a, this line right here is a fully loaded, uh, relatively modern SAT solver with all the features, algorithmic stuff. It's been engineered quite well. Uh, and what they did for this study was, uh, this is the number of instances uh, solved over time, if that wasn't, uh, if it's not readable there. Uh, what they did was they removed single features to see how important are those features, or are they really just made redundant? Because this is a long period of research that led to this agglomerate, uh, you know, accumulation of all these uh, inter interacting features. Well, if you remove clause learning, it puts you all the way back here. <laughs> so that's no good. Uh, so this is a very important technique, and that's, I think that's why these are generally called CDCL solvers. This really is that important. But I sort of promised you that we would not be in depth first, and we're still in depth first. So we've tried backtracking. We've tried back jumping. What if we just go all the way back to the root? That's kind of insane. Why would we do that? 
Well, if I put it this way, you know, we are setting our decision level to zero. We are clearing out all our assignments, but we're not clearing out the, the learned clauses. So we're not losing progress. It just gives us a way to sort of get unstuck if we're in a difficult part of the search space. Uh, we keep all our clauses, we reset everything else, and then our heuristics can kick in again and make some better decisions. You know, again, if we had had these clauses all, the, all along, uh, we would have been much happier. <laughs> um, so that's the last line on this chart. Uh, resets, resets seem to add uh, sort of robustness. Um, you know, you solve the same instance several times in a row, and uh, you know, sometimes you get this like weird outlier uh, where it times out or something, and this sort of gets you out of that space. You want to do this fairly frequently, it sounds like, um, and there's some subtlety in, in uh, restarting you know, scheduling and stuff like that. So that's all the algorithms we have. Uh, now onto the rants and you know, whatever else I have. Uh, but first I want to sort of take a slight detour here to go back to the NP complete thing. Uh, the first one was legally binding, this one's just kind of for me. Um, I watched a talk by uh, Thomas Bell on automated theorem proving, and I saw this slide. This is an adapted version of the slide, and it's the first time I really got uh, on the sort of visceral level what's happening when you're moving to these declarative approaches. And these are the uh, complexity classes that I think we care about in this conference. Uh, what's in the undecidable space, right? Closure. Any Turing complete thing is, you know, at the worst case, uh, going to be undecidable. What's in the semi-decidable space? Core logic and SMT solvers, the first order logic stuff. Uh, I, you know, we'll come back to SMT solvers, and of course this thing at the bottom here is SAS. So there sort of really is a trade-off here, at least that's the way I interpret this. Um, you know, when, when we sort of lower our problem and, and confine ourselves to these constraints, these declarative things, we, we really are forcing ourselves to use simpler stuff and we can uh, make you know, maybe different guarantees about the tooling and, and stuff around that thing. Uh, it still doesn't completely explain why we are able to solve these problems at all. If n equals a, a million, uh, exponential, you know, two to the million is not so good. Well, it turns out uh, you know, th these things aren't random. Uh, so on the right here, we have a, a random SAT instance. Um, you can see it's just like a hairball. That's going to be your worst case exponential time uh, nonsense. Uh, but on the left is actually a, a real problem from industry. And it has all this structure. You can immediately see the structure in that thing. Uh, well, we're humans, and we have human problems. Uh, you know, we're not solving random things. So the, to the extent that we can take advantage of the structure in our problems, these you know, solvers uh, can see symmetries um, and do clever heuristical things, they're going to solve these things that are supposed to be like you know, 2 to the n or whatever uh, much faster, it feels like. All right, what's the actual current research? Um, well, if you, I, I do encourage you to go out and read some of these papers. I, th I find them actually fairly readable, I'm, and I'm new to this. Uh, but if you do, you're going to uh, encounter some notation that you might not be familiar with, so I've sort of brushed this aside for this talk. I call this my alien language slide because I'm explaining one alien language with another. <laughs> um, so the, you know, the sort of caret thing and the upside down caret thing, that's and and or. Uh, the right angle thing, that's not. Uh, the aerial, we've already seen implication. Uh, I did make a cheat sheet. Sometimes when I'm reading this stuff, I get a little cross-eyed and I forget which one is which. Real talk. Um, so I made a cheat sheet. Uh, I like to th think of these things as arms. So and is picking up both of its arguments. You know, it both need to be true. Is this stupid? I know, it's stupid. All right, this one's even more stupid. So or does not care, <laughs> right? Either one can be true. So uh, yes, I actually do this uh, when I, okay. Uh, areas of research. Basically, everything that you could think of around this topic is a, is a current area of research. I'll, I'll pull out a few of these here. So pre-processing we haven't talked about. You know, after you've encoded your problem, there's still some rewrites you can do before you hand it to the SAT solver uh, to make things a little bit easier to solve. So those techniques are like symmetry breaking, um, block clause elimination is another one to Google. Uh, the decision making, uh, heuristics for that. Uh, there's a whole other class of solvers called look-ahead solvers that use more global heuristics, and they're you know, more expensive because they're going over a large uh, part of your problem uh, to make those decisions, but they are going to make better decisions. Uh, and parallelism, I'll point out, because it's sort of counterintuitive why that's difficult. This sort of seems like something that should be sort of embarrassingly parallel, but as I think, I think what's happening is you're pruning out more and more of the search space, so it's hard to keep all your cores and all your machines going on something like this. So parallelism is kind of tricky. There's a, a really good paper uh, on a technique called Cuban Conquer. 
and it blends look-ahead solving and CDCL solving. So it uses look-aheads to make smarter decisions earlier, and then CDCL solvers on what's left and hammer out all the, all the, uh, the rest of the stuff. The other place you'll see SAT solvers in, is inside SMT solvers. Uh, so SMT stands for Satisfiability Module of Theories, which sort of like you gotta get to like a sort of a Zen place before you get that name. Uh, but the satisfiability part is the same. It really does use a SAT solver inside. Uh, but the nice thing about SMT solvers is that they have a much more expressive uh, constraint language. So you can use integers <laughs> in sets and lists and bit vectors, uh, you know, unbounded integers, uh, which you can't do with SAT. Um, and how does this work? I, I really tried very hard to figure out, like, where does SAT fit into this equation? Uh, well, I, you know, this is my current understanding of this. Uh, you pull out all the integer stuff in your expression, hand that over to an integer solver, and then in its place you sort of leave a hole, like uh, the result of that clause. And so the SAT solver is sort of grinding on the whole problem, deciding which combination of clauses to be, need to be simultaneously true, and then informing the other solver. So it sort of sits in between all these other solvers, and they call them theories. Um, I'm going to hand wave that because I don't understand as much about that. Uh, but that's the sort of relation, uh, at least conceptually, to SAT. Uh, so it enables these things. And where do these things uh, really get used the most, uh, at least right now, uh, is in other tools. Uh, because I, I do think um, you know, declarative programming in general changes the way you write systems and, and, and uh, tools and things. Uh, but specifically, I think like SMT solvers and stuff uh, are ch just changing the architecture of these things. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll give you one example to show you what that means. There's, a, there's an awesome talk called Super Optimizing LLVM by John Regeer. He's also at University of Utah, where Will Bird is. Uh, and he's a really good teacher. I, I really like this talk. Um, and I'll just give you kind of the uh, crux of the, of the thing. If we look at a piece of code like this, uh, when does foo get called? This is not a trick question. So when the, you know, the, the less than condition is met, you know, foo gets called. When does it get called now? Well, you can, we can all look at that. Uh, seems like never. This is not like a JavaScript wat moment or something. Um, you know, that's dead code. We, we would like our compiler to eliminate that and figure that out. Uh, so if you were writing this compiler pass, I want you to just take a moment and th think about how you might try to find that sort of pattern and eliminate that. What if I change it to this? This is still the same thing. Uh, this is still dead code. You still like it to find it. And I can put more code and make it more and more complicated. And it gets harder and harder to think about how you might write a pattern to, to sort of find this thing and eliminate it. And that's just one instance of dead code. So there's sort of this uh, compiler economics of like taking your source code and handing it to a compiler. And it goes through a, a number of compiler passes that all sort of look like this. And there's some kind of hand coded pattern matching thing, this is very general, obviously. Um, and then there's some uh, hand-coded analysis that sort of safety check to make sure that this optimization can, can sort of fire. And then if it all works, oops, if it all works, then we rewrite your code and make it better, hopefully. So super is his tool, and he's trying to get out of that, ec that bad economics game. Uh, and all super, you know, the, the main thing that super does is it takes your code and translates it into a bunch of constraints that you can then hand over to an SMT solver and ask questions. Uh, so, you know, is this dead code? Or can this be replaced by a fixed integer? You know, is this always the same result? Uh, things like that. You can ask the SMT solver, and maybe, maybe it times out and it doesn't do anything with your code. Uh, so it does hand those constraints over to an SMT solver like Z3. And the beauty of constraints and working, you know, in, in that sort of world is that these are referentially transparent. They're always going to return the same answer. Uh, you can just put a cache in. So even if you spend a day solving one of these uh, little problems, you can just stick it in the cache, build up your cache, and the next time you compile, uh, pull it from the cache, and hopefully it doesn't slow down your compile time at all. So as these things get more and more expressive and more and more powerful, I think uh, we start to feel like we have one of these, right? Uh, and everything looks like a nail. Um, I certainly get into this mode where I get all excited. I watch John Regeer, and it's like, oh, cool. Um, but I have to like sort of temper myself, so I invoked the sage wisdom of Tim Ewald a, couple, a few years ago at Conch, and he's got this like, really beautiful whole talk about woodworking and stuff, close your hand tools. Uh, but he has this slide that jumped out at me when I saw this a few weeks ago um, about automation changing your perception. You know, uh, when, we, when we do these things that, that make it easier, it's, it's good to have powerful tools like this, 
Uh, but it doesn't mean that we can like turn off our brain, right? Um, so I think there's a certain amount of like taste and stuff in using these things, and I, and I, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, anyway, with that, I will leave it on Tim's note and just say thanks. Uh, I hope you learned stuff. I hope I didn't say anything too wrong. I, somebody can correct me. Uh, I have more uh, uh, references and links to other talks and stuff there. Come find me, like I said. I, I like talking about declarative stuff, core logic. Uh, we use declare rules in production and stuff like that. Um, or if you just want to learn how I made a hammer out of keynote shapes. Um, anyway, have fun. I'll talk to you later.